Hi, David Bain here from Digital Marketing Monthly, and I'm pleased to be joined by Liam Martin today, co-founder of the remote team productivity tool, timedoctor.com. Liam, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Liam's been kind enough to contribute a great article to Digital Marketing Monthly magazine called The Lazy Man's Guide to Outsourcing Customer Service. So I'd like to take this opportunity to probe his thoughts a little bit more. Okay, straight to the first question. A lot of businesses may be concerned at the prospect of outsourcing their customer service function. They may feel that a third party wouldn't be as conscientious or as reliable as doing it in-house. How would you uh, alleviate some of those concerns, Liam? Mm. Well, I mean, number one, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate being here and being able to talk to everybody. Uh, so I would say that implicit within your question is really um, is really the problem that I'm trying to fight as someone who runs um, basically outsourcing software, outsource productivity software. So that's the feeling that um, a, an outsourced employee is an essential part of your team. Okay, so for me, like I think the difficulty comes from employers getting over the hurdle that just because workers aren't in your physical office, they aren't as reliable or conscientious, conscientious as, you know, a brick and mortar employee. So the way that I actually look at alleviating those concerns is number one, um, for me, it's using some kind of time management software. If you are running an outsourced team, then I think that you need some type of time management software and or some type of project management software. So uh, project management software, you can go and get something like uh, Basecamp, which is you know the, the standard one that a lot of uh, small businesses use. And you can go all the way up to enterprise level, which is a Microsoft SharePoint. I don't know if you've heard of either of those two companies, yeah. but they're both great options from the most expensive, a multi-million dollar purchase to I think that Basecamp is something like uh, 20 or 30 bucks a month. And then uh, the next one is really once you have those pieces in place, it's keeping your employees accountable. Now, my platform, which is Time Doctor, that's to really focus on tracking employees' um, activities within your business. So it's kind of like um, if you've ever heard of Google Analytics before, I'm sure you, I'm sure you have. Yeah. It's like Google Analytics for your workday. So you can track your own productivity and you can track your team's productivity. So that's what I say when I'm saying keep your employees accountable. Now, there's a lot of different options out there. Well, maybe not too many different options. I would say that I'm the best, but you know, you don't have to necessarily use our software. Any application that literally just keeps your employees accountable in some type of way when they're working remotely is the next critical step when uh, you want to be able to start outsourcing <clears throat> your customer service. The third one, and this is the one that is most difficult for most employees or most entrepreneurs to really get their head around, is uh, proper training. And proper training boils down to the, the employee being able to get all the documentation that they need to be able to accomplish that goal for you. So whatever that goal may be, whether it's customer service, web development, marketing, pay-per-click, SEO, whatever it is, you need to be able to have that documentation in place so that the employee can accomplish that task. Now, the huge sort of breakdown for most classic managers is that they see classic management exactly the same, the same as they see outsourcing management. But here's the kicker. If I've got, you know, if I've got Susie over in the next room over there and Susie does something wrong or Susie needs help, I can walk over and just say, here's how you do it right, Susie. But with outsourcing, Susie is 10,000 miles away. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of outsourcers, a lot of outsourcing businesses collapse. I would say within, I can set my watch to it within 30 to 45 days, they usually abandon their outsourcing plan. If they don't have the right documentation and the right system set in place, what I call process design. So you need to be able to build proper process design into your business. And the way that you do that is literally by figuring out exactly what that employee is going to do. So I'm taking customer service. It's, uh, you know, answering phones, answering emails, all those types of things building specific step-by-step -step procedures for those tasks and then having those employees um, or, or having that documentation 
sent directly to those employees so that they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing 24 seven. And okay, the, yeah, the, the last one here, and this is something that maybe isn't necessarily gonna connect with everyone, but it's something that I personally try to implement with our team at Time Doctor, and that's uh, really company culture. So keeping your employees connected to what you're doing, if they don't feel like they're giving something, if they if they don't feel like they're making a, a valuable, um, a, a valuable, if they're not a valuable addition to the team or they don't feel like they're a valuable addition to the team, then that can sometimes really, that, that's basically like poison for, um, for a remote company or a brick and mortar company. So in both cases, I would say that company culture is a really critical piece to be able to make sure that you have in place. Um, we do it virtually a little bit different than most people have. Like we have something called the, uh, we call it the water cooler chat on Skype. We've got uh, 56 employees on one Skype chat and we just talk about whatever we want. Uh, whenever there's a birthday, you know, we'll do we'll do videos for everybody to talk about their birthday and we'll, we'll send them some presents or something like that. We basically just keep everyone informed so that they feel like they're a family and that company culture can 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 be built um, on that platform. Wow. And do they actually have remits at all or is this all virtual relationships you're talking about? So we do meet face to face from time to time. But the right. majority of the time, it is virtual. So like as an example, I can do a large uh, Skype chat with a lot of other team members. And for, every, for anyone that doesn't know what Skype is, basically it's uh, what we're working on right now. So it's a, uh, it's a video, collaboration, video collaboration tool and chatting tool. So we can chat on Skype, we can send messages back and forth, and then we can also do team meetings. And I think you can do a video meeting of up to eight people, if I'm not mistaken. So we can all get together on our video chat and it really changes the dynamic when you can see someone face to face. Everyone can start, you know, joking about stuff. We usually make sure that they at least spend five to 10 minutes just chatting about whatever they want to chat about, just like you would in a regular meeting and then directly get into what they're doing. And we also do meetings that have nothing to do with business. You know, we'll just have a meeting about, um, well, like as an example, I had my birthday a little while ago, and uh, the uh, the team decided to put together a little, a couple little uh, YouTube messages for me. So saying, "Hey, you know, uh, this is why I think Liam is weird, and this is why I like Liam, and this is why I don't like Liam," and uh, it was fun, you know, to be able to get that access, and everyone kind of rallied around that particular event um, virtually. So, and, and we ran the entire th thing through uh, kind of a base camp thread in essence, where, you know, we could put up the announcement, we put up the videos, and then people can add in their comments down below. So very cool, lots of fun, and it kind of makes you feel included within the team. So you mentioned a lot about tracking there, about analytics, getting your systems right, getting your culture right. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thinking about profitability. How can you measure whether or not it'll be more profitable to actually outsource your customer service? Mm. Well, for me, um, I focus on KRAs. So those are key responsibility areas. And uh, that really relates back to my, my, my sort of more of an existential concept of standards versus perfection. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they demand perfection within their businesses. And, and I completely understand that uh, perfection is a good thing, particularly when you're in charge, because you're the person that's constantly looking around to be able to make sure that the product is as good as humanly possible. However, with specifics to customer service, you want to be able to create key responsibility areas and be able to make sure that those apply to actionable quantitative standards instead of your qualitative version of perfection. Because perfection is this existential concept. Um, you know, what is, the perfect, uh, what is the perfect pair of glasses? Well, that's different to every person, right? And my perfect pair of glasses could change dependent upon the day, uh, the week, the month, whatever. I could say, well, you know what? I don't really like these pair of glasses anymore. I'd like another pair of glasses with uh, big black rims on them. And that's my definition of perfection. So that always changes. Perfection, even though we think it doesn't change, really does. It's a qualitative indicator. 
whereas standards are quantitative. So a key responsibility area would be for customer service, um, literally every email that is sent to the company, what must be answered within three hours. That is a, that is a standard, right? The context of that email relates to perfection. And we can work on that later. We can, we can actually apply standards to that later. But in terms of standards, in terms of literally figuring out exactly what that employee is supposed to do, we can track that to be able to say, okay, were emails answered within three hours? And you can do that through your ticket system, uh, whatever ticket system you run within your business. So um, I can't remember what we actually run through ours, but literally our, one of our KRAs is that within three hours, a ticket should be answered. So if you email Time Doctor, you'll get an email back within three hours saying, um, you know, here's the problem. We're, we're trying to work on it. Please bear with us. And, uh, and thanks for emailing us. So that for me is a standard, whereas, you know, perfection of perfection for me would be within one minute, but that's impossible. That's just an impossible metric to be able to achieve. And to be honest with you, it would change dependent upon the situation. So we had a server problem about uh, two or three uh, months ago. And, you know, some of our, some of, basically one of our instances went down and, and some of the, the response times went down on our platform. And I wanted this problem say, solved immediately. So I was freaking out and I told everybody, uh, I basically said, everyone is fired if we don't solve this problem in the next 20 minutes, which is an, an emotional reaction that I had. Uh, but that's because I was letting my perfection out instead of connecting to standards. Mm. What are the key responsibility areas? Who is responsible for those areas? You know. Uh, my server admin is responsible for keeping the servers up. The server is currently down. How do we solve this problem? Boom. That's a key responsibility area. And you can basically, you can measure that because you've created a quantitative measurement instead of a qualitative one. So once you've achieved these KRAs, then literally you just have to find the most efficient way of serving those KRAs. Okay. So like as an example, if I've got a, uh, if I've got a process for answering customer service emails and I've created this standard process, then we need to be able to figure out how can we most efficiently accomplish that task or how can we move up that KRA? How can we make it better while re retaining standardization across the board, i.e. everyone has to do at least the minimum, i.e. the KRA. Um, most outsourcing of customer service really boils down to in my opinion, response time, quality of responses, and sales. So those are the three metrics that we follow with regards to customer service. So how long did it take to email that person back or call them back? The quality of those responses within that message. So, you know, did they miss anything critical? Um, one, one thing that we've been doing recently is we can also see a new customer that comes in. We'll look at their Twitter, fit, their Twitter page, their Facebook page. Uh, you know, whatever else they may have, their, their Flickr page. And let's see, let's say that we see something that's interesting. Um, or let's, let's even say that we're looking at their business. In the response, we could say, uh, let's say we're looking at an internet marketing business, like the 26 week plan. I can say, okay, you know, I've checked out your website, the 26 week plan. It looks really interesting. And uh, you must have this type of problem within your business. So we're going to try to be able to solve this as, hum as, as fast as humanly possible. Being able to get that human context and be really interested in or be engaged in what, uh, in, in what the, the customer is going through so that we can help solve that problem as quickly as possible. And the last one is really sales. And that's one of the best quantitative measures that you can get. Um, you know, if, if one customer service agent is making x and the other customer service uh, agent is making y figure out why the the uh, the first one is making more money than the second one and then try to replicate those conditions uh, across the board excellent okay so it's all about efficient um, procedures and if you go about um selecting the most efficient procedure mm -hmm. then you go about um focusing on systems after that getting the best system and um from your perspective a lot of that will involve outsourcing obviously mm -hmm. um and then i would imagine that would lead to greater profitability but um 
even if it is a little bit more profitable, surely a lot of businesses would prefer to have a team of people in-house. Um, what would you say to people who actually say, I prefer to have a team of people that I can actually say things to directly and get people to respond to me straight away? Mm. I would say that there is definitely a place um, for internal team versus external team. And that is... Uh, <clears throat> It's a very interesting debate because it's an issue of how do I most efficiently solve my KRAs? So if you believe that you most efficiently solve your key responsibility areas by having internal staff, then go ahead and do that. Um, if you've run the numbers, if you've literally done the experimentation and you know that offboarding, offshoring your team, your customer service team will not actually allow you to complete those KRAs as cheaply or as efficiently as outsourcing, then by all means stick with your internal team. What I would say to that though is make sure that you've tested it because the presumption is that uh, there's this weird presumption that outsourced employees for some reason are less intelligent or less efficient than uh, than internal ones. And that's just not true. Um, I would say actually the reverse is true. We've found with us, we, we run a team of uh, 56 employees across nine different countries. And our team, I would put our team against basically any other customer service team uh, around and they can easily do as much product push through, if not more than uh, someone who's running an internal team, because really they're a lot more focused. Uh, the time that they're spending at work contains a lot more flow state focus in it than, and flow state focus is basically just a metric that was thought up by this uh, uh, Professor Miliahi, I think his name is, that basically shows whether you're completing a single task, the amount of time, the percentage of time that you spend on completing one single task within your business. So as an, as an example, a developer would be uh, writing code. That would be a state of flow state focus. So how much time did they spend writing code versus answering emails, jumping on Skype, communicating with other people, having meetings, all the junk that doesn't apply to their main block of time. So for us, we see using the outsourced model that our uh, flow state focus is quite a bit higher than you know comparatively to a brick and mortar business. Now with that said, there are some people that I think are critical to a brick and mortar business, i.e. I think that you know having a founding team being in the same place at the same time, a founding team that's looking at the architecture of how the business is supposed to come together over the next you know month, quarter, year, three years, all those types of things. I, I think that those teams really do need to be together. But other than that, I think that uh, most other divisions can be outsourced and be running more efficiently than in a brick and mortar business. Right, okay, so you'd encourage people to at least test something to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many different types of customer service, of course, over the phone, email, social media. <clears throat> um, are all methods of communicating just as appropriate to outsource or is there a particular method of customer service that you would suggest to actually try outsourcing first of all? I would say that um, for me, I, I would definitely, if you were going to do an experiment, I think the first step would be email. Uh, that is by far one of the easiest things to be able to outsource with regards to customer service. The uh, documentation is very simple, so literally it only requires text documentation, whereas a phone customer service agent would actually require you to record calls so that you could provide that extra layer of insight for your employees. Um, I would say, you know, social media is another one that you could look at outsourcing. Basically, if it can be digitized, then it can be outsourced. And this is something that, you know, uh, I I've had... I've even dealt with some businesses <clears throat> locally who uh, or, or some friends of mine that run customer service divisions and you know they've they're, they're 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 kind of fearful for their jobs to be honest with you because once you realize that you're no longer competing against the rest of your city you're competing against the rest of the world i.e. I'm not going to find the best customer service agent at $40,000 a year 
in you know New York, but I'm going to find the best customer service uh, service agent at forty thousand dollars in the world, then the playing field really changes, and there are a lot of people out there that can provide adequate if not superior customer service and just because they're not located in your office as long as you have the documentation in place you'll be able to solve that so for me the first step would be outsource email see how that goes then go to phone and then you know even go to um, like we're doing right now so as an example for me a lot of the customer service that I do is literally face-to-face uh, -face video calls like this. And that gives you an amazing context because I can do video calls with people all over the world and it's one of the cheapest weapons at my disposal. And I can then, when I see them at a conference six months later, they know my face. Uh, I know that if I meet you at a conference, David, I'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to know each other's faces because we've just had this conversation as opposed mm -hmm. to just firing back a couple emails. Okay, so if someone was to make the decision to actually outsource their phone-based customer service. Mm -hmm. What would you say is actually the pros and the cons of doing that? Because surely it's not a completely perfect world outsourcing everything completely. So mm -hmm. what, what's the bad points and um, do the good points definitely outweigh that? Okay, so I, I would say the pros with regards to outsourcing phone, phone support specifically is number one cost. Um, you know, that that's one thing that it's just more efficient to be able to have a committed team wherever they are in the world just focused on getting on the phones and answering um, customers' problems. The other one for me is scalability. So with an outsourced customer service team, you don't necessarily, if you have, let's say you have 10 customer service agents within your brick and mortar business, and then uh, you need to all of a sudden get another 10 people within your brick and mortar business, but you don't have the space. Well, you've got to go get another space. You've got, or you've got to move. You know, you've got, it's a big change with regards to your bottom line. With outsourcing, however, you can literally just hire 10 more agents. You can install a PBX line into each agent's house, and then that agent can basically be onboarded within a week or two with the documentation that you have in place. So for me, I mean, I couldn't specifically put a number on it, but I would say it's probably going to cost you about a quarter of the cost from a bureaucracy standpoint, from you know payroll, um, housing them, the equipment that they need, all these types of things, as opposed to literally you know having them in your office and then the other advantage is obviously that you can expand or contract as quickly as you want so you know we have uh, if we had grown if we had grown in a brick and mortar from zero to 56 people within a year it would have been a much more difficult thing to accomplish as opposed to outsourcing from zero to 56 people within a mm. year. The scalability issue is, is a lot simpler for us. Literally all we have to do is get all their contact information, set them up with payroll, and uh, basically they're off to the races. They use their own computer, they run their own show, and we just literally sit there and, uh, and get the labor from them. The cons on that side is, you know, there are quality concerns, and uh, I completely understand that. I would say that that does not compare for us anyway, as long as you overcome the training component, quality concerns are not a big issue. Now, that also connects to the second con, which is education. It requires a different type of training process to be able to train outsourced employees as opposed to physical ones. As I said before, process design. Um, you know, figuring out what processes a, a customer service agent should be doing, creating documentation, optimizing that documentation and then figuring out a way to digitize that documentation so that it could be sent anywhere in the world at any time. Those are the big pieces that you have to be able to put in place before outsourcing your customer service um, with regards to education. So make sure that you have those in place and if you don't, don't start. Uh, there's no, you might as well, I, I have a lot of people that come to me and say, uh, I'd like to hire 50 people and you know they've never outsourced before and i'll say why don't you just start with one and see how that goes mm. even though i'd love for you to uh, to hire 50 people and for me to take a cut of that that is you're, you're going to fail 
um, definitively you'll fail. You need to be able to create the systems first with one employee and then scale from that one employee. And then, you know, the third one is onboarding. So being able to get that employee up and running properly, I would say that with, if you have the space for a customer service agent within your own business, within your own brick and mortar business, and you bring them in, you could probably get that person up and running within a week. And I would say with digital, with basically outsourcing and the digital documentation of education and process design and being sent to your employee and all those types of things, I would say the process usually takes two weeks. And uh, yeah, I would say there's probably a two to one ratio. So it's going to take twice as long for you to onboard that employee as opposed to a brick and mortar one, because the brick and mortar one literally can just ask a question and someone else can answer it for them immediately with outsourcing this time dilation and space dilation. So um, yeah, that would be the third concern. But again, for me, the cost concerns far outweigh the, uh, the direct concerns of literally you know, onboarding an employee for an extra week. If you're looking for a long-term employee, if you're looking to add someone to your team, that's not just gonna work with you for the next month, but for the next few years, then uh, an extra week of time to save literally you know, 75% of your overall costs is definitely a price that I would pay. Right. So you, obviously you say start with one outsourced employee and it, if you're going to, if you're wanting to have 10, 50 outsourced employees, then you obviously need systems. Mm -hmm. But with your first outsourced employee, um, do you need to have systems or can you actually get them to help you develop your systems to begin with? With your first employee, I would have some version of a system in place. So uh, it will be an incorrect system, but you've got to take a crack at it. And this is literally, it's a process. So you're going to build a system. Uh, I, I call it the four Ds, which I can't remember right now because they're <laughs> literally somewhere caught in the back of my brain. But basically what I, what I suggest that employees do is uh, they design the process. Okay, they, or sorry, first they deconstruct the process. So they figure out what those tasks are within your business. So let's say it's, you know, it's outsourcing customer service, it's writing an email. So what is the history of that process? How does that process, why did that process come about? However that process exists, whether it's just, if it's you writing emails to people for customer service, fantastic, it's a lot easier. You can figure out, why did I write an email like this? Why am I writing it this way? You know, why am I not writing it another way? So de deconstruct that process. The second step is to be able to design that process, right? Process design. So get the, the, st the steps in place, have a, have a piece of documentation together. Um, we, as an example, rewrite all of our documentation in English and Tagalog because a lot of our customer service agents are from the Philippines and Tagalog is Filipino. So it just allows them to onboard a little bit faster when they can learn in their first language. So we set up all those steps and then we send it to them. And then the third step is you go and you basically tell your employees what's wrong with this process. How can I make it better? How is this, you know, uh, wh what are the problems associated with this? What do you not understand? And then you go back and you literally grab what those employees said and then you edit the document and you go through those three steps over again until the fourth step is no longer needed i.e the step where you literally get that input and you refine the process again so it's just literally a cyclical process of refinement and then it usually takes me about two to three tries before i've refined the process perfectly and then literally you have a perfect process in front of you and uh you can you can that documentation can be applied to not just one employee, but 5,000 instantaneously all at the same time. And that onboarding process could occur from, you know, one, one employee to an infinitesimal amount of employees. Right. Okay. Okay. Start with something. It doesn't have to be perfect, but start with something. Right. Um, okay. You've made this, uh, the decision to actually start with outsourcing. Um, what should you look in a specialist outsource center. What exactly should should you be, you be looking for in terms of support to get you going? I would say if you're looking for a specific center, then um, you really want to be able to look at 
So th there's a couple companies that I do work with. Um, I would say connection to process is really critical. So being able to make sure that they have an exact process down, what are they doing? Um, how are they putting together their documentation? Are they talking to you about documentation? Do they already have preset documentation that you can edit a little bit so that you know that that process is running reliably? Uh, the other thing that I would do is I would test multiple firms. So if you have, let's say, uh, let's say you need 10 agents, I would probably at least get two different firms and I would split them down the middle and go five agent, five agent and see how they go over the next month. Um, another thing that you know really works well is get a couple friends of yours to call them up and be angry customers and see how they deal with it. Uh, that's, mm. you know, that, that's one that you can usually do and, and, and test the boundaries of how they react to, um, to those angry customers coming in because those are the ones that really, even though they're usually for us, I mean, for every hundred great customers we have, we have one bad one. And uh, that always happens. But the one bad customer can really bite you uh, later on because that one bad customer, uh, you know, can spread that negativity across the internet. So you want to be able to make sure that even with the bad ones, you've got a proper customer service process in place so that that customer is happy. And then I would also look at, you know, also look at, I, I would look at internalization of your team. So from an outsource perspective, I mean, so instead of hiring a firm that's going to do that outsourcing for you, which, or that the outsourcing with customer service and those firms usually charge, I would say, uh, probably about 100 to 200% of a cost. So if, if a customer service agent the real cost of a customer service agent is, let's say, five hundred dollars. Um, you know, a, a firm like that would charge between one thousand and fifteen hundred dollars for that agent. So that's a significant margin. And if you're not willing to be able to take on that margin right away, then I would look at internalizing your team. So maybe hiring one or two customer agents, customer service agents yourself, being able to look at those employees and say, okay, I'm going to work with them, uh, and I'm going to try to train them up myself and see what successes I have. In the majority of cases, unless you're running a very large scale team that you would need to get rid of on a regular basis, so let's say you only need them, you know, let's say you need 500 agents one month and 20 agents the next month, then I think a firm is a great place to go. But if you've got a continual stream of customer service agents and you don't need to onboard, you know, 50 agents in one month, then I would say actually internalizing is the best way to go about it because you are in charge of the process. So you will know everything that's going on and you have uh, a complete understanding of all the pieces that run within that division. When you completely outsource it to a firm instead of individual employees, then you lose some of that context and that can be problematic down the road. Right. I'd imagine that what scares a lot of businesses is the prospect of transferring their customer service function over to an outsourced company without disrupting the experience of existing customers. Do you have any tips on how this transfer of responsibility process can be best managed? I would say, uh, for me, I, I would say that it's re it really comes down to a challenge of the individual um, firm. So if you've got a firm or the individual company. So if you've got a company that um, customer service is a critical part, mission critical part of your business, then I would definitely keep your outsourcing to yourself, i.e. definitely outsource it, but keep it internal. Don't give it out to a firm because the firm is not going to carry your company culture. It's going to carry that business is company culture. So those guys are interested in making a, in getting a check. Uh, they're not necessarily interested in solving those customers' problems. So for me, you know, if it's mission critical, definitely I would not even touch um, some of those firms. Now, if I was, if it isn't mission critical, um, and I would say there are a lot of businesses that fit that that category, then. Um, really just be experimental with it. So, you know, if, if you know that you can solve, if you know that you can solve your employees, or if you know that you can solve your customers' problems easier and faster through that firm, 
definitely experiment with it. Take a few days, uh, take a few weeks, months to be able to move it over, but make sure that it happens in a staged process and make sure that if there are problems that arise, you're not stuck with zero customer service team. Um, if we lost all of our customer service people, our company wouldn't stop, but it would definitely get damaged within the next month or two before we had to onboard more people. So be able to make sure that, you know, if you're moving over to a different customer service, if you're moving over to one of these firms, take the time to be able to uh, stage it. So maybe one month you bring over two agents to that firm. And then the next month you bring over another four agents. And then, you know, by the end of the quarter, you've got all your people over, but you're going to make sure that at least one or two of your internal people are that were customer service agents, maybe move them over to different divisions so that they're always going to be available. And if there is a problem that pops up, you know that they can jump on it and solve it very quickly. So um, finally, I'd like to ask a little bit about what you think the future of outsourcing will actually mean. Um, is in the future outsourcing going to be something that um, a lot of online companies at least will be doing? Is it a fad? Is it um, just going to keep on increasing in popularity from here? Well, I mean, I know that I could throw some statistics at you, like as an example, by 2016, and this is a projection, but it's based off definitive fact and, you know, significant data, one out of every five Americans will have a remote job. So, you know, 20% of the U.S. working population will be outsourced or remote working. Um, I would say that it isn't a fad. I would say that that's going to accelerate with, uh, you know, even from an environmental standpoint, the, the amount of resources that someone has to invest to be able to drive 40 minutes to an office where they sit in a cubicle with all these other people and do work and, uh, and then drive all the way back to their, you know, to their, to their houses and do the whole thing again the next day. It's not it's not a an efficient use of your time and it's not an efficient use of resources and as those become more expensive outsourcing i think will only become more important moving forward with that said i think there will always be a place for brick and mortar employees i don't think they're going away but i would project i would say probably within the next 30 to 40 years i would probably give you, I would, I would do a $5 bet that the majority of employees would be working remotely. Um, we do it within our company. Now, obviously we do because, you know, we sell outsourcing software, but even then we have a few of our team members that work internally, um, that are, you know, that are in our direct office that literally work with us face to face. So I think there'll always be a ratio, but it, right now, I mean, companies that understand that you don't have to restrict yourself to finding the best, the best web designer in New York for 60K, but instead they can look for the best web designer in the world for, for 60K. Once they understand that, it's a complete game changer. Literally those who can't adapt to this change will be able, I mean, the, the people that can adapt to this, these types of changes will be able to grow faster and better than ever before. And those who don't you know, do that. I, I'm sorry. I think they'll be left behind. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that this this is something that will be here to stay. And um, if people don't accept that new reality, then uh, they'll be left in the wake of it. Mm. It's it's certainly incredible how quickly it's evolved over the last few years. I, I remember back in 2005, I actually got a website designed uh, using a service called Rent a Coder at mm -hmm. the time. Um, it's um, it's another name now, actually. I forget what it was, but um, um, it, it's it was fine, um, but it was very much um, set up by IT people for IT people and not that user friendly. But mm -hmm. um, fast forward seven years, and it is absolutely mainstream now. So it's just phenomenal to think actually what it's going to look like in another seven years' time. I'm, I'm sure outsourcing will be exceptionally mainstream then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that. Really, right now, it's uh, th there is a th the one major barrier that we have. There were two major barriers that we had that we've overcome in the last decade. The first one is cheap communication. So right now, we're doing a video conference halfway across the world. 
uh, 10 years ago, this would be impossible. We could not accomplish this task. And it's just simply because there's been so much pipe that's been laid all across the world that now, you know, we're a small piece of that fiber optic cable that's somewhere under the Atlantic right now that's firing back and forth. And that's why we can communicate for free. We're using Skype. Skype is free. Um, it doesn't cost us a penny to have this. This is absolutely amazing. This is, you know, science fiction level stuff, in my opinion. The second one that relates to that, so, so due to that pipe being laid, and a lot of telecommunications companies lost a lot of money because they laid all this pipe thinking that this was, this was going to be the next huge piece. And there was all this money that was invested in laying this throughput, in laying this, this pipe. And then a lot of those companies went out of business um, because they overestimated the market. And now we're left with all of this pipe that basically is, you know, um, very undervalued in comparison to what it was 10 years ago. For us to be able to do this type of transfer would have cost us not only a lot more money, it would have been physically impossible. Mm. So that's that's the first piece that was overcome. The second piece, which is being overcome right now, is the platform and the software to be able to accomplish those tasks. And rent coder is an example of that. There are a lot of other outsourcing sites um, that are examples of that. And then, you know, for us, Time Doctor being the software solution for that being able to keep a project management, task management system in place so that wherever I am in the world, I can literally work um, just as efficiently as I would in an office. So if I have a laptop, I know that I, number one, can work efficiently and that I can be kept as accountable as humanly possible because I have these software backends and platform backends to be able to manage this process. So that's the second part of the project. And I would say that that is, uh, that's, there, there's a lot of innovation that's happening right now in that space. And it's making, it, it's, it's basically breaking down that last barrier for outsourcing to really become mainstream, i.e., you know, by 2016, have 20% of the population mm -hmm. remote. Um, that's, that even surprised me as, as a metric. And I think that that will only accelerate with, um, these tools and these platforms being available to the general population. Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting. Um, I mean, I originally come from the north of Scotland, actually, mm -hmm. and for years, communities out there were uh, leaving in droves and actually going to the big city centres. But now it's the opposite. See, those kind of communities are starting to grow again because people can work from home, people can work from wherever they want, and, and it's exciting, as I say. That's, that's the other thing, too, is, you know, I don't have to be in San Francisco. Um, and, and, and being a, uh, you know, a startup guy, that's where I theoretically should be. And yes, I do have to fly down there from time to time, but in reality, I don't have to stay there because if I want to talk to somebody from San Francisco, I can grab them on Skype and I can do a video call. And in five years, it will be a virtual reality matrix call. You know, it will literally be, we'll be able to sit down in my living room and have a conversation as opposed to have these monitors face-to-face uh, -face like this. So that's the exciting change that I see happening very soon. And once it does happen, um, you know, I, I have this concept called uh, training the hundredth monkey. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hundredth monkey. I think I, I, think I, I told think you. I have done, no. Okay, so the hundredth monkey is, uh, so they, they, they drop these nuclear weapons off the coast of the Atlantic on these little islands and you know completely blasted them and then uh you know the, the bombs went off and then about 10 years later what they decided to do was reintroduce monkeys into the population into the into the island to see how humans would react to fallout so everything was going well except that the shells of the coconut were radioactive so some of these monkeys you know were having problems with the radioactive shells so they brought 10 monkeys off the island and they trained them on how to clean their coconuts in the water so they would no longer be radioactive. And, uh, you know, that worked out well and then they reintroduced them back into the population. And the first year, there were maybe like 20 monkeys that were cleaning their coconuts. And then the next year, there were like 48. And then the third year, there were like 72. And something interesting happened when the 100th monkey started cleaning their coconut. All of a sudden, the population of 10,000 monkeys started cleaning their coconuts all at the same time. They achieved that salinity point that 
the idea needed to be able to be adopted into the mainstream. And I feel like outsourcing is at that point for us that we're very close to that hundredth monkey. I don't necessarily know when it's going to hit, but when it does, uh, it's, it's going to explode. Please, um, Bloom, please tell us a little bit about Time uh, Doctor and how people can get hold of you. Sure. So uh, Time Doctor is literally task management and analytics for outsourced teams. So with it, you'll be able to monitor your team members and also know exactly what they're doing. And for somebody who's hiring their own staff, um, it's a really great option. You can get in touch with me at uh, on Twitter, and that's at VTAMethodMan.com. That's my original Twitter handle. And uh, it's usually the fastest way, way to get in contact with me. And then also, too, I'm always on Time Doctor floating around. So, you know, if we, we offer a 30-day trial with no credit card required. So you can try it without any, you know, uh, requirements on us. And if you have any other questions, I'm always there as one of the customer service agents. So you just literally type in, you know, send me to Liam and uh, I'll be able to talk with you within three hours. Excellent. Well, really, thanks again for joining me today. And thanks for joining me on uh, Digital Marketing Monthly. Thanks a lot.